Thank you very much, Omar, for this lovely introduction. Thank you all for being here. I'm so happy to be here. So, does this work? So, um, as Omar um, explained briefly, in my practice, I'm, I'm interested in problematics that are somehow inherent in the architecture practice itself um, on a very micro level, such as the unbridgeable gap between architecture and dwelling, something that has been dramatized, magnified by uh, different processes of modernity and modernization. On a more specific level, I'm, I'm very interested in revisiting, I think more than interested, in revisiting the relationship of uh, construction to land and time to the temporalness that is constantly mutating into a permanent state. That, of course, is in reference to uh, the extended Palestinian refuge and exile, but also hoping to touch on uh, the, 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 the contemporary condition of deterritorialization in general. So automatically, these, these questions are tackled from sites of, um, tackled through sites of knowledge, whether practical or personal. Um, um, but I have to say the personal he becomes more of a, uh, a case study rather than a, rather than personal history. As an example of these sites, uh, Amman, uh, where I have lived most of my adult life, uh, is the definition a city of, uh, of a city of refuge. Um, some, of course, may disagree with that, but it, ha it is somehow the embodiment of the permanent temporariness in a very subtle way. Um, another example here comes the more of the uh, site of the of the practical experience. Nahr al the uh, Palestinian refugee camp, is a camp in the north of Lebanon that was completely demolished by an Islamist fundamentalist. Sorry, after a conflict between an Islamist fundamentalist group and the Lebanese army, uh, that was back in 2007. Um, in account of demolition, 33,000 refugees were dislocated, displaced, um, and an accumulation of more than 60 years has been completely bombarded. Uh, the complete demolition took place after the battles were concluded by the Lebanese army. So, so somehow it was unnecessary, of course, um, and, but it didn't require any public justification or clarification because, partially I think because it was promoted as war on, on terrorism, but fundamentally because, uh, because the camp is an extraterritorial space. So uh, if you look at the very dense tear-shaped uh, fabric, that, that is the camp and what's around it is the extension. Um, this is one of the images uh, after the destruction. Um, one way to look to look or to define uh, to define a refugee camp is um, is as an extraterritorial space, which is a designated space uh, outside the national boundary of a country from a juridical point of view. So, um, but the application of this extraterritoriality somehow can can be different from one host country to another. But we can say um, we can agree on a certain level of fragility, regardless of how different the application is. Um, but extraterritoriality extra as a notion, um, it means a when, when a body, uh, a place, an object, uh, is out, so being outside the, the, the local jurisdiction uh, in a particular context. For example, embassies, UN bases, military bases of a foreign country on another country's land, um, diplomats. Um, um, so in, in this context, the, this notion is a manifestation of superiority in a way uh, in, in this specific territory. However, when the same notion is applied on, uh, on a camp, for instance, it 
it becomes the complete opposite. It becomes a tool of marginalization, uh, exclusion, and even abstraction, uh, which I think is the most dangerous here, because any action is abstract in, in, uh, in a non-juridical space, and it does not require any justification, as necessity is defined by authority, you know? So, a few years after I have joined the team of the reconstruction, as a as, um, few years after the, the destruction of the camp, that was, yeah, a couple of years actually. So in 2009, I joined the team of the reconstruction um, as an architect and an urban planner. I have to say that I kept uh, a critical distance um, by choice, I think, because, because the idea is so, uh, Contradictory. What does it mean to rebuild a camp? What does it mean to build something that is so elusive, so uh, incremental, and completely driven by need, as opposed to the desire and uh, the, the desire and the ego of the designer or of the design in general? So, despite this critical distance, it was clear that the project held so many revolutionary potentials within. Um, on a political level, it was. The, the first Palestinian refugee camp to be destroyed and reconstructed in an official framework. Um, and so Nahr al-Balad wasn't actually the first camp to be destructed, obviously. Uh, many, uh, many camps still linger as empty sites uh, in Beirut, for instance, such as Tal al-Zatar and Jisr al-Basha. Um, but also, uh, on a practical level, uh, uh, it was so seductive, this idea of, you know, uh, a, an invitation to rethink what does it mean to rebuild the temporary? How, how, is it possible to rethink uh, the spatial reality of the camp? Is there anything to do? And even on a more complicated level, how do you rethink building in the temporariness in general? So. Standing in the empty, bulldozed land of Nahr al-Barid, there was an overwhelming promise, let's say, something li so liberating from this vast emptiness. It's, very, it's a very guilty one because, you know, it's departing from, from a point of destruction, but still, this, this promise of the new was so overwhelming. And to think of this image, the land of a camp, um, in, the, in, the, in, in the context of Palestinian camps, um, it's, it's so bizarre because normally the land does not really exist. I'm not, say, I'm not saying it does not exist, uh, uh, you know what I mean? It does not exist visually, but not only visually. We don't see it. We don't, it's, it's not there. It's not important. We only see the horizontal expansion of the camp. We see the vertical expansion of the camp. We see, we see time. We see time inscribed in space. The land is not the location. The land is not important. And suddenly to be confronted with this land, um, it's very overwhelming. So, uh, and somehow the camp was suddenly was present in this land or the land is present in the absence of the camp but then again, a camp at this point, the camp to be, was seen as a threat to all lands. I will explain later what I mean, but. So this promise of the new uh, slowly had brought uh, new constellations of power um, as the reconstruction process, although it was, oh. <laughs> was it a long time? Okay, so, so this new had brought new constellation of powers. Um, um, the reconstruction process, although it was, it was uh, mainly a participatory process that involved the community, but also to, to be able to, 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 to do it, to rebuild it, 
it had to involve, the process had to involve the army and the state. And um, so where the planning, um, the, 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 the master plan uh, was, was conforming to security measured, uh, measures imposed by the army and also portraying the government's wish uh, or let's say desire uh, to make the new camp, the camp to, to be built, a model camp. And that's, and it's, uh, uh, this is a, uh, this as an idea in itself indicates more destruction and more violence. So this confrontation with the physicality of the land generated somehow obsessive uh, attempts to understand the meaning of, of it, uh, philosophy of ownership, uh, collective ownership, individual ownership, what is the meaning of both, what is the meaning of the lack of both, or I don't know, the deformation of them. Um, and um, sorry. And uh, is that, could, could that be somehow reflected on architecture and planning in this case? Uh, it was an idea I was trying to push while rethinking the spatial construction of the camp, trying to maneuver this very rigid master plan uh, that, was, um, that was basically molded by a decree, uh, a decree that was approved by the prime minister and approved by the army, uh, summarizing the whole process of the camp, the whole process of reconstruction in four points, such as limiting the vertical ex expansion of the camp to four, uh, to four uh, stories, regardless. So the threat, the vertical and horizontal expansion of the camp, the right to refuge and, and be, and extend uh, is, is seen as a threat and rationalized by protecting the right of return. You see, the, the notion of right to return is a very, is, uh, it has been, um, return to Palestine, I mean, uh, has been used and adopted by contract, contradictory discourses uh, along the years against Palestinians, actually. So uh, governments would uh, rationalize or legalize uh, excessive discrimination uh, sub, you know, uh, on Palestinians, uh, especially refugees, uh, in the name of protecting the right of return. So, if the camp is seen as one monolithic form, well, then why can't we, from, from authority, from outside, from, from the city even, uh, then why can't we, depart from this point and subvert it in a way, uh, physically using this, this notion of lack of ownership or collective ownership or whatever that is, you know, which also, show, which also shows how one, referencing myself, uh, can, can easily fall into the trap of projection, uh, even, you know, this trap of the non-implicated gaze, even, even if you are in, in the event. But of course, the reality on, on the ground is different. Um, the core demand was of the community was to rebuild the camp the way it was, with its social fabric, neighborhoods, location. And I believe the demand was based on a conscious rejection to change, to an unjustified change, since it was triggered by an unjustified destruction. So, which made any, any architectural proposition like projected just as an idea, new architecture proposition. You can see like how, how neighborhoods uh, and how is the fabric somehow the same but still providing or conforming to requirements uh, of, of the master plan, like wider roads, which is also good of course, but I mean it had provided or caused more uh, or let's say complicated the situation even more. So, So questions, thoughts were accumulating somehow on an abstract or let's say uh, theoretical level. Uh, every thought was actually in, in response to a situation on the ground, uh, sometimes from a very particular design problematic uh, or you know, impossibility to follow some point in a decree. Uh, and, and this idea would, would be later transformed into 
a simple architectural gesture, which will be later rejected by the different stakeholders. In other words, the collective moment that was possible in the community in reclaiming their role as in the participatory process, this, this collective moment um, was achieved through mobilization, advocacy, and so on. Let's say it wasn't matched with a similar uh, architectural moment or, you know, or another moment in design. Um, with a with con constant confrontation on the ground, the question gradually transformed from how do you uh, build a camp into how do you build and dwell in suspension? How do you even die in suspension? Paradoxical dialogue um, and comparisons accompanied me constantly as I crossed borders. Uh, I was then uh, driving constantly between Amman and Nahr al-Barid, which is a trip that is no longer possible. Um, so in this constant crossing, scenes were created in an inner monologue uh, that is constantly fed by the everyday life of transition, uh, moving, uh, crossing, building, rebuilding, and so on. Um, and gradually transformed into radical, or maybe utopian, maybe dystopian possibilities superimposed on images of land that is collected from Nahr al-Barid and around uh, Nahr al-Barid and um, questioning how do you build without the land? You simply just denounce all lands. So this series of paintings uh, titled No Sheep's Land was the very first immediate reaction to the situation on the ground. Um, I guess the question becomes, what, what becomes of building and, and dwelling between what's imagined and what is real and between the temporary and the permanent? And really the question transformed from, to, from, from these simple problematics on the ground into how do you build without a land? Which had become the title of an ongoing project since 2011 um, the project is constructed from several elements. Um, some are poetic, some scientific. Uh, but I think um, obsessively thinking of what does it mean to be at the limit of things or what does it mean to be defined by the absence of something. Of course, again, rethinking this idea of the temporary being transformed or mutated into a permanent state. Um, and stressing this impossibility of dwelling while even the poetical dwelling uh, while living in the temporary. Um, one of the first elements of this project, I think I see it as an extension of the previous exercise of No Sheep's Land which is a blueprint. A blueprint is composed of uh, a wooden model and a drawing. Uh, I think this, and also No Sheep's Land, I think both of them are somehow uh, inspired by the legacy of radical and utopian architecture in the postmodern uh, World War II. Uh, and, but of course with different point of departure. Uh, many of these movements departed from an existential plight of dwelling uh, in relation to modernity. And so, and basically so that the answer in trying to subvert some sort of authority, and of course each defined authority in a different way. And, but surprisingly, or I don't know, it was fascinating how every single movement, every single attempt was somehow translated this subversion in the same way, which, which was uh, deserting the surface of the earth, either by hovering uh, above it or by escaping into the underground. Of course, we have many examples, but I was most fascinated by New Babylon, by Constant. He imagined 
uh, this is one of his, his uh, models. He imagined uh, space, the space of justice as a space of no labor. Uh, and um, he was designing for the player man. So play is the subversion. Um, the, the proposition in, in, in its core is, of course, very utopian, but it comes from a, very, from a position of privilege, to say the least, assuming uh, that all people are in the same starting point, uh, equally mobile, no class struggle, no liberation, no national liberation issues, and so on. But this is exactly what utopian proposition does. So, but in this context, it had projected a system of universality and elitism that is exactly similar to the system they were trying so, to subvert, making, um, making the question of dwelling and even uh, an ever lingering one. Uh, uh, so, so Blueprint is Blueprint is composed of uh, a small wooden, mo wooden model and a drawing uh, facing one another. Um, I think uh, it's about the space that is in between them. Um, uh, there's some tension there, I think. So while the model hovers suggesting a space in between utopia and dystopia, a space that proliferating a corner that uh, which it occupies, um, the drawing on the facing wall represents the possibility of such a space as if it was built, uh, suggesting uh, uh, what I think is somehow uh, useless like empty signs of architecture, and I think this could be it, like how to build without the land could be, uh, um, it, it could reveal somehow uh, the impossibility of, of dwelling through empty signs of just sublime uselessness in a way. Uh, so could building without the land be a form of rejection to loss, to, to uh, to all forms of normalization and coping and numbness through these signs. Uh, another element is uh, a map that is always drawn in a wall and destroyed after the exhibition uh, and the and text. Uh, yeah, it's clear. Um, the map is a drawing that is constantly um, visiting the frontiers of Palestine, retraces them from current Google Maps, uh, so the Jordanian, Syrian, Lebanese, and Egyptian uh, frontier strips are unfolded, retraced from one side, that is the opposite side of Palestine, and densities, settlements, landscape, terrains are somehow transformed into these, these line dots, uh, just simple pictorial uh, forms, um, that are unfolded and then reattached, becoming maybe an organic, somehow a live line that is neither real, neither completely real or imagined. Uh, so um, a line that is defined by an absence, a line that contemplates on being at the limits of things. At the limits of things, yeah. More of the details. And the text underneath is an etymological exercise departing from uh, the word, the root sakana in Arabic, which, uh, which is the translation I chose for dwelling. Um, and um, it's somehow like building through language and the meaning that is embedded within the, the limits of the word itself. So, um, a body of thought is constructed around the root and its derivatives, and how how uh, how it's used differently in sentences. Um, and the word has two meanings: one is to remain or stay in peace; the other is being still. Um, so somehow, um, this linguistic complexity that is 
embedded in the world, in the word itself, reveals an impossibility of dwelling, uh, like reveals an impossibility that is. Yeah, so basically uh, it reveals the impossibility of dwelling that is embedded in the word itself. Um, uh, and hence at the fact that we can only uh, dwell at the end of things def and everybody defines the end in their own way. Another element uh, questions is the production of data for the extraterritorial space. Um, so being in the extraterritorial space, the camp had no documentation uh, whatsoever before its destruction, and except for four photos, four aerial photos, uh, taken in different phases for different purposes. Uh, in 1950, this one um, was taken the year of the establishment of the camp, two years after Nakba. In 1968, uh, one year after receiving the second waves of Palestinian uh, refugees after 67 war, and 1994, a few years after the uh, end of the uh, Lebanese Civil War, so I guess there was some sort of a, a national mission in documentation, uh, documenting aerial photos and so on. And finally, in 2007, during the battles, just before the bombardment, a very gorgeous take, and nothing afterwards. So I collected something from uh, Google Maps 2013, and you can see the same shape empty except for a small cluster uh, that was built at that time. So all of these images were unified uh, in scale. Uh, I tried to unify in scale, uh, tilt them, uh, uh, tilted them to respect the, the north sign um, and were located um, in one unified white space, um, a paper. Uh, where the location of each image indicates centrality, flow from and into uh, and into the camp, uh, in the times each photo was was taken. Um, we start from the very beginning. It's it's at the corner, the 1950. Uh, so the camp was uh, actually um, it had before its destruction. It had become a, uh, a center for the northern region in in Lebanon. It had transformed into a commercial hub. So it was a very central point, transforming into the center. So I did that to all of the previous images, but not for this one. This one, I, I didn't have to do anything because it was really a very comprehensive take. And then going back to the corner as the flow from the camp was towards the south. Um, so looking from, from a distance uh, at this line, we can see we can see some logic how how authority uh, how basically we can read authority in the making of of data for the extraterritorial space. So, however, this invisibility can be seen in a different way in different times. So. During the bombardment of of the camp, a group of activists and the refugees of Nahr al-Barid were mapping the bombed buildings one by one. Uh, gradually, this process of mapping the destruction uh, became a process of reclamation of a spatial reality that was never documented. Uh, a construction of a mental space. This is one of the, the earliest maps. So detailed maps of, of social structure, architectural plans uh, were reclaimed completely from memory, validated by the community, and uh, basically forced the process of reconstruction to go on a very particular direction, involving the whole camp in the process, at least at the early stages. So these documents are really unprecedented in their form 
um, they're unique in a way. Uh, and in, in so, so I mean, if the extraterritoriality was the logic behind an unjustified destruction of the camp and the invisibility of it, it indirectly enabled the reclamation of space, the space of the camp, uh, from memory. And I think like many, uh, many moments in this extended refuge and exile, many uh, failures, or let's say moments of, um, many moments had transformed, uh, or let's say, um, were a point of, were a, a moment of failure, failure, but then they became moments of resurrection in a way. Um, and maybe it's a loop, I don't know. So this grand gesture of reclaiming space from memory has transformed has transformed the refugee from being an extraterritorial body uh, into an active, an active one, an active body that is part of a political movement, let's say, a uh, moment, sorry, and somehow in, in control, uh, as I said, at least in the very early stages. But the very same grand gesture, if you look at it as if we can consider this a grand gesture, has has of course uh, its imperfections. The reclamation process uh, at the end of the day was, was done by individuals and could be of course affected by individual interests. So, but one of the interesting um, reasons for, for discrepancies and imperfections and so on uh, was the misunderstanding of space. I mean, the inability to imagine a space uh, and projected into measurements, X, Y, Z. So, so the discrepancy between the, 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 it's the discrepancy between the theory and practice in a way. Uh, so in many times, the imagined space, the reclaimed space, and the space to be constructed actually never met. As as an example uh, for this, one afternoon, and uh, after a long argument with one of the refugees on what was his reclaimed, validated space versus what's going to be uh, reconstructed, he decided to show me what he had recorded uh, on his mobile phone from live TV coverage of the attacks on Nahr al-Barid. The video framed a building in the middle of semi-ruined context that after a few seconds, a few seconds collapsed. Um, his daughter and wife could be heard screaming in the background. But for the man, this video was nothing but, you know, an evidence of, of something. Uh, he, he said in a very calm way, just count the columns. How many columns do you see? So the Evidence of his memory had become part of the mechanical procedure of analyzing violence, um, its planes, pixels, to extract the only reclaimable thing in this case, which is the number of columns. The number of columns can indicate the area, actually, because um, the, the common know-how, the easiest span you can achieve uh, is a module used in the camp and in many informal uh, building uh, methods uh, is between three and three and a half meters, um, which is basically part of uh, building know-how in a way. So this measuring unit takes us to a very fundamental idea or a moment. Um, and I want to explain it through this picture. So this image is an archival image from UNRWA, and it documents the transformation of tents in Al Baqa uh, refugee camp in Amman, on the periphery of Amman, in 1970, um, into three by three walls. So this unit had multiplied, expanded, 
proliferated horizontally and vertically, becoming the, the, the site that we see today. And this is, of course, one literal uh, transformation of uh, the temporary into permanent. This is like the, you know, you see it. It's clear. However, I'm trying to think beyond the walls of the camp. I'm trying to collect permanent temporaneous in all trajectories, in all migrations and exile. For example, between Amman, um, between its history, how, it's, how it connects or segregates itself from Palestine or Palestinians, how always there's a schism between the nation and the national, um, how the city itself has become the, the permanent temporary space. So you have this pole, you have another pole, which is Nahr al-Barid, uh, an extreme example of making the temporary as permanent as possible with infrastructure and master plan and so on uh, after its destruction, as if it's like it has an added loop, you know. Uh, uh, so between the two, two extreme, one very subtle and one, one is very uh, clear, um, I think there is like a spectrum, uh, a very wide spectrum of typologies uh, and definitions of what permanent temporaneous is. One of these moments, uh, for example, is the moment, sorry, um, uh, is just a second. Is the moment of transformation of the pillity space. The pillity is, you know, the structure of columns covering the volume of the of the building. Something that is of, inter was introduced by Le Corbusier as one of the five uh, rules of modern architecture. So um, another moment is it captures the the transformation of a pillity space. Uh, in a modernist apartment building in, in Kuwait in the 1970s 70s or the 1980s um, to accommodate more migrant workers, m many of which were Palestinians. Um, and the other moment that I just mentioned, the, the camp transforming into, into, uh, into walls. If we look at the two moments, one is, is archival, uh, is documented, it's very clear, Another is imagined, reclaimed, from, it's not imagined, it's reclaimed from memory, still it's um, imagined somehow because it's not uh, concrete in a way. One of them represents the margin, the module. Uh, the other represents authority in a way. Uh, the vision of the architect, uh, the grid, and also the dichotomy between who builds and who dwells. Uh, and yeah. So let's say they, these uh, ideas were foundation blocks to, to a project that is, I'm still working on called the Rahala, um, which means the traveler. It, actually, it's not an accurate translation, but I chose this translation by, you know, consciously. Um, and the Rahala is a process of collecting spaces, architectural typologies, uh, and know-hows um, of this, idea of dwelling in suspension and in waiting. Uh, some are reclaimed from memory, some from experience, um, but those spaces are reclaimed, um, then uh, materialized, becoming, uh, let's say, a record, an archeological site, a topography, I don't know, but it somehow representations of different typologies of, uh, of these spaces. Uh, and the method is basically just to freeze a, vi a visual memory of a space, then deconstruct it into angles, materials, uh, shadows, light. Uh, and by that, another layer is revealed, uh, regional references, alienation, and somehow these different attempts of trying to unravel the unknown in different host countries and their processes of uh, modernity. Um, in this building I'm departing from, the one I mentioned in, in Kuwait, the logic is modernist in its materials, uh, the finish, the logic of the pelleti, and so on. 
But the space of the Pelletie meant something else, meant an extra space for accommodation, affordable housing, choice of, or housing choice for more migrant workers. So the transformation of the space is another inscription of, of, uh, of time onto space. Uh, who builds, who plans, as opposed to who really dwells, uh, who inhabits the space. Um, so, and how building the spectacle of the national image uh, and dwelling in, uh, in it uh, are two parallel lines that sometimes never actually meet. Uh, in this process, one is either um, a user of the spectacle and the other is just a witness of it, even if the lateral is the actual builder of the spectacle. So these reclaimed spaces um, extend somehow or become part of the deterritorialization of migration. I think in particular mig migration of labor. I have to say the model here is not really a mock-up for something to be built. So yeah, sorry, Rahala is basically uh, the ideas are represented through models and drawings, but the models here is, uh, is not a mock-up for something to be built. And uh, in fact, it's an abstraction of a, of a moment, of a material reference, of a know-how, and it's not as... <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, it's not of a of a specific space. Uh, you can't put a function on it. So, and somehow the material becomes the the knowledge that is embedded within the material itself. The meaning of a terrazzo tile, the meaning of the travertino, of the marble, and the contrast and the the traveling of the material and the migration of the material and the know-how that is embedded within. So fragments of spaces are recollected from uh, memory, from imagination, archives, and then declared as archetypes. So basically, I'm reclaiming these, these typologies as buildings in the permanent temporaneous, uh, as archetypes and typologies of, of this dwelling. Um, and um, yeah, and the scale of the model is revisited, of course. It's not, uh, it's about building the perspective, the um, building a moment in a space, uh, in a way. Um, the project unfolded to another, um, let's say more maybe complicated one. The title is, is um, Tomorrow Poetry Will Not Be the House of Life uh, that was exhibited in the Biennale of Architecture in Orléans at the Frac Center uh, a year ago, more than a year ago maybe. No, a year ago, exactly, yes. So in this project, I'm continuing this process of collection. However, uh, another layer was introduced, which is uh, two drawings of New Babylon uh, that I borrowed from the museum from their collection to include within uh, my display, within my project, basically. So the project is composed of models and four drawings. Two of them is uh, one of these. Uh, draw one of, yes, this is one of the drawings of Constant. Um, this is the other one. Yeah, to go back to this idea, uh, like many radicals, uh, the critique of modernity and poverty of experience was made through imagining different <coughs> systems, rejecting the, the existing one, deserting the land, uh, imagining endless mobility, inhabiting the sea, the list goes on. So even when made, to when, even uh, there was an attempt made to imagine a communal living, uh, it came from a point of privilege. Uh, so, and somehow I was building up a narrative and by, by including his drawing within, drawings within my, my display, I was trying to critique his critique of modernity. 
uh, another layer was introduced that I had probably spoke briefly uh, about in the Rihala, which is, um, you know, the, the juxtaposition between uh, dwelling in temporaneous and the, the processes of nation building uh, of the host countries. Um, and understanding the moment of modernity in such host countries. So the genesis for, for modernity in the Arab region was in complete isolation, and it's really triggered by different uh, reasons from uh, what produced the avant-garde process uh, project in the first place. So um, while the moment of modernity in, in, in the Arab region gave rise to the notion of nation state, it was also uh, the, the, the moment of refuge and exile as we know it. It's, you can see it inscribed uh, onto space. So a narrative is constructed through the, um, around the two abstract moments that I uh, spoke uh, about in the beginning, um, just in the Rihala, um, the Al-Baqa camp and uh, the um, modernist building in Kuwait. Uh, and in, and many spaces in between, basically. It's a process of investigating material scenes, some from a very monumental na of a very monumental nature, some of a uh, domestic one. And I think in this process, I'm trying to to, um, to reclaim the permanent temporariness as something that can be documented, recognized as part of the architectural typology and archetypes um, of theory of, uh, of architecture, of history of architecture, and not as a side effect in a way. And can this process of recollection uh, and unfolding meaning uh, that is embedded in the in the material can it challenge existing um, knowledge structures in architecture and building? So, yeah, do you still have time or yeah? So, um, no, that. It's a black image. <laughs> so, <laughs> in other projects where the work is, is site-specific, I noticed that um, automatically the scale, uh, the, the logic of the scale is, is, um, is different. It becomes something else. And uh, the body becomes, um, of course, the scale is different, but I mean the, the treatment of it. Um, and the body becomes the unit. So this is an image um, of a permanent public work I did uh, a year ago in uh, a city that is two hours away in train uh, from Paris called Bourges. And um, it was also commissioned by the same architecture Biennale I just uh, talked about. Um, and Somehow, this debatable uh, sentence, form follows function, uh, was actually becoming more and more uh, relevant uh, to me. And in this project in particular, I thought it was really, you can't avoid this. Um, especially when, uh, especially when, when you revisit this, this notion where form is, um, more attached to meaning and function is more attached to purpose. Uh, from the very beginning of, of, uh, of this task of um, creating public permanent work, uh, the meaning of this act uh, to me had to be revisited and not to, of course, dismiss the, uh, the discussion of public work uh, and the meaning of it. Uh, that been ha that's been happening for decades now. But for me, as an architectural gesture, what does it, uh, I was interested in that, uh, public's, uh, uh, public work departing from an architectural gesture. What does it mean to create a public piece? So 
uh, in response to, to, to a particular accumulation of a body of work that I'm, I've just talked about, and, but also, um, also being about the moment uh, and this very particular site, um, it had, I thought it had to be tackled from this notion that form follows function. So the site, which was a previous circus school, circus school, holds on the rim, uh, holds on uh, to the rim of, uh, of the tent. Uh, you can still see it. Uh, and, and a very ephemeral qu quality, you can feel it, it's not, it's not imagined. So the function, since it's the leading role here, uh, had to be dismantled first, I think. So the body, play, subversion, all, we, uh, all these ideas were very present in the early stages of, uh, of the work, even uh, in the empty site. Uh, gradually, the function becomes a promise of an event, uh, of a possible reclamation of a body, by e body and so the form here uh, is uh, a juxtaposition of uh, between a uh, juxtaposition between methodologies I have been developing um, and and this particular moment where the nomadic subversive reality of a past circus becomes very dominant so and the body as as a module and and the building on a unit becomes uh, the, the body as, as a reference and the building unit become really one-to-one. -one. Home is past, which is the title of the piece, is an architectural gesture. Um, um, built by a simple act of piling uh, uh, of a module of a structural local material, which uh, is in this gesture automatically stripped of its basic, of its essence function, uh, essential function, being structural, and um, only to create other meanings, scales, and know-hows. So the work is, is a landscape of movement, of stillness, that can be reclaimed by uh, the body, the public at any point. And Maybe I'd like to finish by this uh, project. Thank you.